Okay, we're in chapter six, cultural geography. And it was kind of a consensus vote, wasn't it? On Monday, that instead of reading through the chapter, we would just talk about the cultures that you're interested in, your cultural origins. So let's see. Who was Pennsylvania? Me. Oh, everybody gets one from Pennsylvania. And for the people online, for the people online, uh, under files. Under, under files on Canvas, you can find this uh, Pennsylvania culture thing. And here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> I mean, we have to take part of the class time today to start Chapter 7. So we won't use the whole class time for this, but we'll just talk a little bit about Pennsylvania and then see if the people who are from Pennsylvania agree. Technically, we're not even from Pennsylvania. Yeah. You just wanted to know about it. Well, well we okay, so we were, we're born in, we were both born in Indiana, and then we moved to Pennsylvania, and then we moved to West Africa, and now we're in Missouri. Okay, yeah. look so. at what this handout says. <laughs> this came right off the internet. America was born in Pennsylvania. Hmm. I'm going, not. <laughs> America was born in the 13 colonies. Wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, it was. We it thought was. Texas had a problem with Texas and the rest of the world. Oh, okay, Celeste, tell us why Pennsylvania is where America was born. It's because that's the area. Like, there's a big town there that that was like the cultural and economic center of early America. And that's where, like, also all Philadelphia the was like were. Philadelphia. Pennsylvania. Oh, Philadelphia, yeah, Philadelphia is in Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. and, that's, and like, that's where the Continental Congress met. Yeah. Oh. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Does that make sense? Now? Well, it's a big step from saying, okay, the Continental Congress met in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but the rest of the thirteen colonies don't count. <laughs> Because we are the birthplace of America. That sounds like Texas. <laughs> okay, you see what I'm saying, Celeste? Yes. Okay. <laughs> what else does it say? Well before Europeans showed up in America, the Delaware and several other Native American tribes. So far, every state we've read about, hasn't it, the Native American tribes were here first? Well, that's because they were in all the states first. Well, then how come we don't show them more respect since they were here taking care of the land before we got here? Because we're selfish sinners. <laughs> <laughs> Though the Dutch, the English were quick to claim either side of the Delaware River. It was the Dutch who settled first in the 1600s, 1630s. That This had a huge impact on cultural demography of Pennsylvania, which remains today in Lancaster County. Uh, Lancaster County, that's where all those Dutch Mennonites are? Yeah, they're called the Pennsylvania Dutch. And Pennsylvania they, Dutch. They have their own language and their own style of food. Mm -hmm. You mean culture. to say some people in Pennsylvania who came here from Dutch ancestry brought all of their Dutch ancestry with them and their Dutch language and maintained the whole thing? The conflict over rights to the territory between the Dutch and the English continued with running battles for several years that culminated in a final treaty in 1674. In 1681, England's King Charles repaid a debt by granting William Penn a massive piece of land that became known as Pennsylvania. William Penn was a Quaker. He encouraged do any of you know anything about Quakers? What's a Quaker? They're, What's a Quaker? They're like plain and they have all these rules you have to listen to and they don't allow like slavery 
Uh, they have a lot of rules. They're like a community that was like Okay, built do you know anything about a Baptist? Do you know anything about Baptist? Yeah. Do you know anything about Roman Catholics? Yeah. Okay, what if I told you that uh, Quakers are a religious group like Baptist and Roman Catholics? Does that help? Yeah. Is, is it, it like, like Amish people? Yeah, is it like Amish? They're, they're like the Amish, same. except they're like not more the same thing, 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 but they're like Amish people. Okay. Yeah. And you can go to the internet and Google what's a Quaker. I'm about to Google it. <laughs> and Quaker. it's like, oh, Quakers. Cause and and I don't think they adopted that name. That was a name given to them by yeah, because people. Because they quake in the Because of they God. would quake when they were in their religious services. <laughs> what is that sound? That's a, well, somebody forgot their And so name. William Penn was a Quaker. Now see, I studied about William Penn and all the things he did in Pennsylvania, but I don't ever recall my history books telling me he was a Quaker. Oh yeah, he was. Yeah, but it's like, why did some of the books leave that out? Well, his father, he didn't used to be a Quaker, and then when he was in like his lower 20s, he oh. was introduced into the Quaker faith, and his father basically like disowned him for it. So, mm. and, and he became apparently a when he put together Pennsylvania, he put it together with a lot of Quaker moral principles. That's why Philadelphia is called what? The city of brotherly love. Brotherly love. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Pennsylvania, the Parking police don't show much brotherly love. <laughs> <laughs> they give tickets and tow cars and smile the whole time. <laughs> we already talked about the Declaration of Independence was drafted in Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Pennsylvania began life as a huge Quaker colony. I'm looking at culture here that encouraged religious tolerance. This ideology evolved into the birthplace of America where the Founding Fathers gathered in Philadelphia to draft the Declaration of Independence and the first U.S. Constitution. And some of the colonies that helped draft this stuff. Here's a handout. We're talking about Pennsylvania. Thank you. That some of the colonies who helped draft this stuff, they weren't as tolerant religiously as the Quakers were in Pennsylvania. Today, Pennsylvania is a fantastic mix of urban demographics in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and rural lifestyle where huge communities of Amish add a wild austerity to the mix. I don't think the Amish would say we add a wild austerity to the mix. <laughs> <laughs> you can find about any kind of person in Pennsylvania. The big cities are packed with Italian, Irish, and even Chinese immigrant communities. In the countryside, there are strong Dutch, German communities. The rich ethnic diversity makes the state a fairly welcoming and tolerant place for visitors from any part of the world. Well, that takes care of that one. Who are we doing next? West Africa? Since it's right here. Now, who wanted West Africa? You did? Okay, I think I found about 10 pages of stuff on West Africa. But the thing that's folded over it is what I'm giving everybody. So you can look at the handout. But since you asked for West Africa, you get to keep the rest of it. All right. So those of you who lived in West Africa for a while, what do you think of this? Cultural history of West Africa. History. Accurate. Mm -hmm. The history of West Africa can be divided into five major periods. Mm -hmm. Prehistory, <laughs> that's before anyone knew anything about it, so people have to make things up. <laughs> Developed agriculture, the Iron Age, extra intra Africa trade, extra Africa trade. Uh, I think West Africa, from what I've studied, intra-Africa trade meant when they traded with other places in Africa. Extra-Africa trade meant they took the people that they were trading with. This is kind of a lopsided joke. 
they took the people they were trading with who didn't pay their bills <laughs> and they captured them and sold them as slaves to people outside of Africa. The colonial period. We, don't we all know that there's... Have you heard that saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire? Mm -hmm. Does anyone know what that means? That Great Britain was colonizing the whole world. They were going every place in the world and setting up little British empires. And they had them spread all around the globe so that no matter where you were on the globe, the sun was shining on one of the British empires. So those of you who live there, tell us something about West Africa, West African culture. Shoot. Okay, well, we lived in Guinea Bissau, but we, the West Africa is like the one of the poorest areas of the whole world. Guinea-Bissau is in the top 10 poorest countries in the world. There is no running water, there's no electricity. You have to walk a while to get to the bathroom and you definitely have to walk at least a mile to get clean water. Uh, everyone lives with everyone. There's no privacy at all. Animals run wild inside, outside your house. Um, the medical situation is really bad. Lydia almost died while we were there. Um, from something as simple as pink eye, the there's like the culture there when you're wanting to get married is the more wives you have, that means the richer you are. So we had this guy that lived next to us who had there were three brothers. One had eight wives. One had five Four wives. Brothers. Mm -hmm. now, one had three wives. And two see, wives. let me just reflect on this culture from Oklahoma. The more wives you have, the dumber you are. <laughs> I mean, once you get married, why would you want any more of this? Well, the more children you have, see, if you have a lot of girls, that means you're going to be very rich because you have to buy your wife with, like, cows and, and clothing and food and stuff. So they want a lot of wives, so the way they have a lot of girls. Now, see, the they here again, just Oklahoma perspective on reacting to this stuff. It's like, that sounds like the guys in Oklahoma who raised pigs because they had big litters. Where cattle only have one calf or two at the most, pigs have a bunch of pigs, and they have them three or four times a year. And it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. And see, I find myself from Oklahoma thinking, why would someone live like that? And what's the answer? And of course, what would a West African say if he came to Oklahoma? Why do you live like this? Why that? do you live like this? <laughs> because we each have our own culture, don't we? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do Texas. Got a handout on Texas here. You want a Texas to last? Mm -hmm. So you get Texas. I think there's a picture of one of your friends on this handout. <laughs> <laughs> Does that look like a friend of yours? <laughs> So, do the girls in Texas look like that? <laughs> some of them do. Some of them do, huh? Tiana, you said no, they don't? No, most of them. Not most of them. I think there are some, though. Well, but this was a postcard from 1908. Mm -hmm. It's weird because, like, People what? People don't really dress like that. <laughs> what I remember about Texas is so different to what everybody thinks. Like, here, it's it's Texas is like, like cowboy or whatever, and I'm like, what I it's went to it. San Antonio in that area, it's like all Mexicans, all Hispanic, mm -hmm. like, and it's so crazy. It's like, okay, I guess they have like different cultures in Texas. Oh yeah, uh, there's so many different cultures yeah. in Texas. So. Well, is that true here in Kansas City that you can go to different parts of Kansas City and encounter different cultures? Yeah, probably. So, so you could, you could like, like if you go more, more in the southern, Region of Texas, she said San Antonio. She went to San Antonio. Yeah. Wait. Is that where is that where you were, Carla, Carla? In San Antonio? Huh? Was it San Antonio that you were? I went. Yeah, I went to San Antonio like a long time ago. Yeah. And it was like really nice. It was pretty normal. There was like about every different culture. That, like I, yeah. I saw a lot of Mexicans, and my yeah. my uncle lived there, and. 
I don't know. There was a lot of Hispanics there. I'm then in I Dallas, can't... and there's a large Asian population too. Like oh, really? it's not just like cowboys. Cowboys. Okay. I thought well. America. I thought the United States was the melting pot of the world. That's what I was taught in school. Mm -hmm. That we're the melting pot of the world. Look what this says. Texas is described as the melting pot of southern and southwestern features. So Texas is the melting pot of the yes. southern and southwestern part of the United States? So that would, Carla, that would answer your question about yeah, all Texas. these different cultures you see there. Yeah. With pockets of ethnic group, town, and settlements in many locations? Carla would say, yeah, that's what I saw yeah. when I was there. South and West Texas, both adjacent to the Mexican border, lack defining features of Southern culture, such as a Southern accent and Southern food, which is more influenced by Southwestern culture. Southern culture remains prominent in Central Texas, North Texas, and parts of rural East Texas. You know what? You can talk about parts of Texas, like if you just take Texas and said, north and east and central and west and cut them in s s quarters they're still bigger than some European nations aren't they <laughs> I mean they're bigger than the whole when I was in Europe it's just okay growing up in Oklahoma where you travel a large distance to go someplace I couldn't believe it you get on a train in Europe and in two hours you're in another country it's like if we were like that in the United States you know what that would kind of mean Every state would be its own country yeah. with its own currency and its own language and its own state government. Yikes. We know like 50 languages. <laughs> yeah, and that's why people in Europe are so, so much more multilingual than we are. because, And that's why, Carla, down on the border in Texas, a lot of people speak Spanish. They're, they're bilingual down there because of where they're located. It's influenced by Hispanic, African, and Anglo traditions. It's a place of island communities from Germany, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Mexico, Africa, Southern, Ang Ang Southern Anglo populations, and historic tribes of Native Americans. So it's more than just cowboys down there, isn't it? Yes, sir. It's the only place in the world where it's past musicians sang Western swing style music in Czech and German. <laughs> that would be people from Czechoslovakia and Germany who still spoke their native languages, who liked Western swing music. That would be Western, that would be Texas dance music, if you're wondering. And they would sing it in German and Czechoslovakia. And by the way, if you want to see something humorous today, uh, Google Japanese singing country western music <laughs> from America. Can we, yeah. It's just I've popular seen. over there in some circles. I've seen that, that's not, uh, <laughs> you'll regret it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's do Puerto Rico, yes. and it looks like, who asked for Puerto Rico? Carly did. So Carly, I've got about a six page handout here oh my gosh. of stuff on Puerto Rico. <laughs> the rest of you, read about Puerto Rico, and let's see if Carla says that's yes. true, that's the way it is. Texas turned out to be pretty good descriptor, pretty accurate description. No, oh, we're not going to do that. So, what does this say? Christopher Columbus landed in Puerto Rico in 1493. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and so I thought that's when he found America. 
Yeah. Yeah, this is his second voyage. Oh, during his second voyage. And he encountered the indigenous people. What do they mean by indigenous people? They're called Tainos. The people who live there, like Native yeah. Americans yeah. here in the United States? Yeah. There were, there were Indians here. I mean, in Puerto Rico, too. And what did their name mean? Land of Noble Lord? <laughs> I've never heard of that, actually. Ah, so even a Puerto Rican <laughs> learned something new here. <laughs> what, what, what? We, what I, we call it, we do call it um, uh, Isla del Encanto, which is uh, Island of the Enchantment, I guess. Like, enchant. Ah. Like yeah, we do call it. I don't know how to translate it. Puerto Rico means rich port. Yeah. Has one of the world's best natural bays. Yes. We have a bi bioluminescent bay. Like, it oh. glows when you touch it. We have two, actually, two of them. Oh. <laughs> After the Spanish American War. Do you remember the Spanish-American War? Um, I remember reading about it, but ah, I was not there. Did any of you remember reading about the Spanish-American War? A little bit? Puerto Ricans are Caribbean people who regard themselves as citizens of a distinctive island nation in spite of their colonial conflict and U.S. citizens, their colonial condition and U.S. citizenship. And they have had colonial conflicts. But they say, no, we, you know, it doesn't matter. Even though we're U.S. citizens, and even though we've had our troubles with colonizers, we still are a distinct island nation of people. This sense of uniqueness shapes their migrant experience and relationships with other ethno-racial groups in the United States. However, this culture's national, nat nationalism coexists with a desire for association with the United States as a state or in the current semi-autonomous commonwealth status. What is that? Can you say it again? <laughs> what's, the, what's the relationship of Puerto Rico to the United States? Commonwealth. Are they one of the states? They're a territory. territory that, why would, why would Puerto Rico want to be a territory of the United States? Said, who said we want to be? A lot of people say that, or a lot of people say we want to be a state. A lot of people say we just want to stay like this. Like we are. Mm -hmm. There's everything in. Because we want to maintain our identity <clears throat> and we can do that. Being a commonwealth, mm -hmm. say, well, what's a commonwealth? Well, we get to share the commonwealth of the United States, <laughs> and we also have them protecting us from people invading us and some other benefits that they offer. Location and geography. It's in the Caribbean. What is Puerto Rico, a crucial hemispheric access point? Oh, as soon as I read that Puerto Rico is a crucial hemispheric access point, that just told me why the United States wants to have a relationship with Puerto Rico. Because if the Spanish-American War was a place where Spain could come to Puerto Rico and use that as a stepping off point to attack America, we want to have <clears throat> Puerto Rico as a relationship to us so Spain can't do that anymore. Does anyone remember back when the Russians decided that uh, when Cuba had a new leader, they decided that they would park some of their missiles in Cuba and aim them at the United States. And President John F. Kennedy said, no, you won't. Mm. And we almost had a big war over that. Mm. And that would be like us going to some <laughs> little island 
near Russia and aiming rockets at Russia. And they wouldn't stand for that either. Oh, they say, wait a minute, depends on who you ask. If you ask the, the president of Russia today, he will say, no, you've got rockets aimed at us in all of those little satellite countries in Europe around us. That's what NATO is all about. No, NATO is about all of us protecting ourselves from you invading us. We don't plan to invade you. And Mr. Putin says, that's what you say, but I know better. And then he says, and I'm no threat. I won't invade anybody. And then somebody says, Crimea? Crimea? Did you read about what happened in Crimea? Did it like up Crimea? Oh, you didn't. Well, you'll have to read about it to see what he did. It was a part of Ukraine. It was a part of Ukraine. It is now a part of Russia because... Putin took it because he needed it as a place to park his ships who are going out to sea. Well, get back to Puerto Rico. A rugged central mountain range constitutes two-thirds of the island. Two-thirds of your island is mountain range? There's mountains like in the middle. Yeah. Now, how tall are these mountains? Um... Are they like hills like in Oklahoma, or are they mountains like in Colorado? I don't think they're like, I, I don't know, I've never been to Colorado, so, but... Okay, Denver is a mile-high city. You know why it's called a mile-high city? Because it's... Because it's one mile above sea level. Are your mountains oh. in Puerto Rico, any of them close to a mile above sea level? Um, probably. Wait, I'll tell you right oh, now. See, okay, she doesn't have to know everything about... See, you guys don't know everything about the United States, right? So she doesn't have to know everything about Puerto Rico. But I gave her that big handout so she could have all this valuable information <clears throat> that I found on the Internet. <clears throat> but you could Google, what's the tallest mountain in Puerto Rico? It's, uh, it's called Cerro de Punta, and it's 4,390 feet. And a mile is 5,280 so it's almost as tall, it's almost as high above sea level as Denver. See, I have to tell you something. <clears throat> Growing up in the flatlands of Oklahoma, when you tell me that, it, that, Carla, when you tell me that Puerto Rico is an island, I'm thinking of flatlands mm -hmm. surrounded by ocean. What she just said was, well, it's actually a mountain range like Denver, Colorado, surrounded by ocean. Well, then that's not an island. That's, I said, well, yes, it is. And, and understand, most islands have little mountain ranges in them, don't they? Or I should say a lot of islands do. And the national forest in Puerto Rico is called a Junque, and it's like a big mountain. And where I live, like, this is where I live. And then, like, you can see the mountain when you look this way, and you can see the ocean when you look this way. Really cool. So think of that, class. You can go to Colorado and look at the mountains, and then you can look the other way and see the ocean. You say, no, you'd have to go to Texas to do that. Well, you're not going to see the mountains. Mm -hmm. And Carla has it all packaged together <laughs> in one little homeland. <laughs> Puerto Rico is densely populated, so I'll bet you don't have 450 people per square mile like where I live, do you? <laughs> you don't know. What's the population density? Like Okay, much. Google. Just Google. What's the population density per square mile in Puerto Rico? Well, this is, oh, okay, uh, 1,112. 1,112 people per square mile, and there's 400 people? No, 140 people? What did I say? 500 people per square mile where I live? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that's too populated. Well, <laughs> okay, we'll stop there, and...
You know what? I had another one to give you, but we'll we won't do Arkansas because he's not here. And I'll save my Oklahoma. No, I already did Oklahoma. I've got Kansas and Missouri. I gave you Missouri, didn't I? Yeah. The other day. I guess I won't give you Kansas. If you want to read it, you'll have to go to Canvas and click on it. But Kansas, okay. Since we studied Pennsylvania, Quakers from Pennsylvania who were anti-slavery packed up and moved to Kansas so they could make Kansas a free state. People from Missouri wanted Kansas to be a slave state, so they packed up and moved to Kansas to make Kansas a slave state. Now, those people from the East, anti-slavery people who came to Kansas, and the people who were pro-slavery got so mad at each other, they started burning each other's towns and villages and raiding each other's, burning each other's fields. It's like, it was terrible. And you know what's really sad to me about how terrible this is? The people who came from Kansas to raid Missouri over this slavery issue were called Jayhawks. And the people from Missouri who were going over there burning towns in Kansas because they wanted to drive those anti-slavery people out of the state were called tigers. Now who's the mascot for the Kansas University? Jayhawks. And who's the mascot for Missouri University? Yes. Tigers. Do you understand that this awful battle they had years ago, they still hold on to it with the mascots of their two major universities? I'm just thinking, that is sad. You people need to let this go. Change your name to Dove and Sparrow or something. <laughs> you know, or, or Kitten and and Mockingbird. I we, don't know. We, we, we like to... Well, I, I, I saw this on a t-shirt one time for, for like a... I, I don't know. K versus um, like the Tigers. And, and, and it was like Miss Who. Like... I, I don't know. Uh, like, <laughs> Well, you know, my grandson, who was born and raised here in Missouri, he was out at KU one summer playing baseball, and he goes, boy, Poppy, I should have brought my shotgun. Well, what for? He said, there are Jayhawks everywhere out here. You could be shooting them like, like sparrows. <laughs> and I thought, where did he come up with that? Just being born in Missouri, not too far from Missouri University, where that kind of thinking prevails. Forgot to mark you here, Christiana. I'll get you now. Good. Okay. So the rest of this chapter. Oh, and by the way, be sure and remember to go to the canvas and click on that discussion thing. And I've got a question for you for this chapter. And after I wrote my little cultural descriptor for me to kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about doing, yours doesn't have to be as long as mine because I get a little carried away with this stuff, okay? So yours can be a little briefer. But I had my wife come in and read it. And, and I think I ended up my paragraph by saying that coming from a, a wheat farm in Oklahoma to the metropolitan Kansas City area and marrying a city girl has been a huge part of my cultural evolution. Is that what I said, Anna? And my wife, I said, read that, Nina. And she said, evolution? <laughs> and I said, that's exactly the way the students reacted when we read that word. But isn't it, I mean, it's, a, it's an okay word to use, isn't it? When we use it in that context of how I have evolved. I have changed. Now, I haven't changed from being a human to being a Jayhawk. I mean, I haven't changed into some other kind of species like this capital E evolution is all about, but, but we do change. And think in terms of how you've, and maybe, obviously you haven't changed as much as I have because you haven't lived this long, but um, 
as you look through this book and think about this stuff, just think about, maybe think about how during your lifetime, you're probably going to undergo a significant amount of cultural evolution, of cultural change. And page 210 talks about popular culture, which is just what's popular at a certain time. And it's popular with people. Page 212 is a cool little page in this book, Coke or Pop or Soda. <laughs> Except I didn't hear him say soda. Do, do any of you come from a place where they call carbonated beverages soda? Yes. Do, do they say soda or sodi? Soda. soda. Okay, in central Illinois, they said sodi. I said, I think I'll stop and buy me some pop. And they go, pop? That's what we call our dad. <laughs> and I'm going, so what do you call that stuff that's in the carbonated beverage machine? And they say, sodi? <laughs> and I'm going, how do you spell that? And they spelled it. I said, Folks, your word isn't in the dictionary. <laughs> you so who like came that. from part of the world where they call it soda? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania? Mm -hmm. Texas. Texas? Texas. I mean, I, I've grown up calling it pop, but I've transitioned into calling it soda. <coughs> you have? Yeah. Because since you've been living in Kansas City? Uh, well... I guess it's a mixture of pop and soda in Kansas, actually. In so. Kansas? That's why people in Oklahoma don't like Kansas, because they don't call pop by its proper name. <laughs> Not our fault. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey, you know, pop, soda, Coke. Have any of you lived someplace where it's all called Coke? You go to Alabama, you walk into McDonald's, you order a hamburger, and they'll say, do you want a Coke? No, I want a Dr. Pepper. And, you, and they say, and you say, no, I want a Dr. Pepper. They go, okay. And they don't even, because what they really ask you is, do you want a carbonated beverage? Well, why do they say Coke? Well, why do we say pop? Oh, I know why we say pop in Oklahoma. Shake it up before you pull the lid off or open the can, and what does it do? Oh, pop. Pops. So that's why we call it pop in Oklahoma. I don't know why you called it soda. It doesn't have soda. Why? It doesn't have soda in it, does it? It's soda water. Oh, bicarbonate of soda is what gives it its fizz. I know some places call it soda pop. Like, so like they mix it together. Yeah, mix it together. Yeah, hey, I've heard that. Yeah. Page two thirteen talks about grouping humans by culture, ethnicity race and gender and is it fair to say when you start grouping people you probably have uh, maybe set the stage for conflict by simply saying all of these people belong to this group when I was in graduate school working on a PhD. One of the professors in one of my classes, there was a, 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 a black student in the class, and since most of the people in the class were women, because we were getting education degrees, this guy and I kind of buddied up, and we were sitting in class and something was going on in the city here, and the professor said, I'll call him Charles, and she said, Charles, what do black people in Kansas City think about this issue? And I said, before he answers that question, could I tell you what white people in Kansas City think about that issue? And she goes, what? I mean, since I'm white, doesn't my opinion represent the whole white community? Yes or no? No. No. Well, since Charles is black, does his opinion represent the whole black community? No. No. This lady didn't even know. Now, today, is that kind of behavior called racist? Yeah. So then when somebody says to a Christian, so tell me what Christians think about that, aren't they being a little racist? <laughs> 
I mean, it's just like the word's thrown around a lot, but it's just that the idea that when you hear people saying that all all people, okay, I, I hear this person talking about all people of color. So who would that be? All people of color. Everybody. Everyone, <laughs> who doesn't have a color? <laughs> if you didn't have a color, you'd be transparent, wouldn't you? <laughs> but who are they really talking about when they say all people of color? African American. Okay, some people are probably thinking African Americans. A lot of people who use that phrase are referring to all the people who are of non-European ancestry. Why do you exclude European ancestry? Because you European ancestry people are dangerous and you're a menace to society. You have been suppressing people of color all over the world for centuries. Technically, we have like us in this classroom. That's right. Okay. See, it's like, so who have I suppressed? It's like I haven't. See, that's the whole point. No matter where you are, or who you are, when you start grouping people together and making group statements about them, you've just become. A racist. You understand what I'm saying? And there are a whole lot of people who are calling people racist, and in the in the in the sense of doing it, they're actually behaving like a racist. Now, is it fair to say historically that okay, if you've looked at the question about where did you come from? I went to Ancestry and ran through all of my ancestors on my mom and dad's side of the family and found a list of all the countries they came from where I could. It's under discussions on Canvas. So does that mean all of my English ancestors were a part of dominating the world? No. Were all of my French ancestors Roman Catholics who persecuted Protestants? No. In fact, my French ancestors went to England as religious exiles. They were Huguenots. And I had to look that up to find out what that meant because they didn't <laughs> teach me that in school. And ended up coming to America. Oh, were all of my ancestors? Huguenots? No, probably some of them were Roman Catholic who stayed there and were glad to see the relatives leave France who had become Huguenots because they were an embarrassment to the Catholic relatives. You understand? You almost, you, you really, this grouping thing just creates problems. And when people start I don't know, going off on other people, generally, they end up making generalizations that would label them as racist. If, if somebody else made that statement. I mean, if some European made the statement that all people of color are, do you understand what that would be doing? It's like, you can't say that. You just can't say that. And by the way, some people of color who are very conservative have actually said, I've had people tell me that, they tell me, here's why I'm a conservative in my politics. But my liberal friends who are people of color have a word for me. Anyone know what they call him? Uncle Tom. They use a derogatory term for him because he's a person of color who embraces conservative politics. I have a friend who's a pastor in town and a, a liberal politician came to his church to answer questions one time 
and the people in his church were politically conservative. So they were asking all these questions about why is this going on? And he and this liberal politician of color was so outraged by this church of color asking, criticizing his liberal policies that he just said, I don't have to take this from anybody. And he called them some ugly name and got up and left the church. Whoa. But can that go the other way? Can conservative people get together and take liberal-minded people? Let's take uh, European ancestry. You have a European ancestry, and so you look at another person with a European ancestry and say, uh, you're not really European ancestry because you don't embrace my political views. And I'm thinking, no, you just, you just can't. When you start grouping people, just treat everybody as an individual. That's really what has to happen. But this guy that I was in class with at the university, we both were going to the program together. We both were in a program of study that would prepare us to be uh, public school superintendents. And I said to him when we finished, I said, you've actually made better grades than I have in class. You're really more qualified to be a superintendent of a school let's say we'll say Lee Summit. So if both of us fill out an application to be the superintendent of a Lee Summit school and we put our picture on the application and mine is freckled Oklahoman and yours is African American, what's gonna happen when they get the two applications? Now see, this was a long time ago, but I said, it's obvious they would not hire you to be their superintendent. They might hire you to be the assistant superintendent. To me, you, you follow me? And I said, that was wrong. And I took offense, personal offense, at a fellow classmate being treated like that. Now, you can understand my offense, can't you? Because I was offended for him. But I graduate from school and get a job he graduates from school and he can't get a job. Can you understand how offended he might be? Somebody said to me one time, why are these people of color so upset? <laughs> and I said, if you had been treated like they have been treated, you would be upset too. He said, no, that was years ago. No, it's not just years ago. It's still today in America. And we have to understand that and be sensitive to that. And if you haven't experienced it, you probably ought to go someplace where you can experience it. When you were in West Africa? We got treated bad because we were white. Yeah, because everybody else is people of color and you're people with no color. <laughs> wasn't, wasn't a, uh, I, know, I know in like some countries, like, a, like some, some, they're, they're some of them have like a term that they use for like white people. Branco. Branco. Wait. Branco. 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 Okay. Branco. It means white person. Okay. Okay. They would sing a song. What was the song? Branco pelele, preto mau mau. Which means, I don't really, I'm not really sure the exact translation, but it's somewhere around to white people something. I'm not really sure what impalele means, but it's really mean. Don't they also say, like, uh, like I've heard, Mazungu, or uh, is, that, is that not African? That's not, that's probably South African, because most people generally think that African is the language everybody speaks, but there's so many different languages. Like, in our village alone, there was, like, 15 different languages. Really? Yeah. yeah. The Portuguese-based Creole was the main language in our village that we had to learn, but there was Balanta, Balanta Naga, Balanta Mami, there was Njako, and, uh that's only a few, I can't remember off the top of my head, there was a lot. Okay. And see, that's when you take the continent of Africa, you say, whoa, there's a whole bunch of different cultures and language groups on the continent of Africa, and, and you, you can't just lump Africans all together. You can't just lump anyone all together. On page 216, it talks about behavioral geography, so where do you shop for groceries? Walmart. Walmart? Price chopper. Price chopper? Aldi. 
All days? Target. Target? You understand that we, we tell something about our cultural identity by where we shop. Page 217 is an interesting picture to me. It's a residential desirability. A, these are the mental maps of places residentially desirable in the heads of students at the University of California in Berkeley for A and uh, in Alabama for B. Does this surprise you? The people in California think you ought to be living in California. They give it a hundred. <laughs> and the people in Alabama are given Alabama a hundred and northwestern Florida. And see, when I look at this, watch, this is my culture. I go, what do they all say about Oklahoma? <laughs> Neither one of them want to live there. So guess what? My Oklahoma reaction is, I didn't want to live in Alabama and California either. So <laughs> there. Oh, 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 look what they put on, look what A put on Alabama. Uh. Zero. <laughs> Zero. So look at your home state. What'd they say about Texas? People from Alabama give it a 73. People from California give it a 47. And I say, so what? Guess what's happening to people in California? All those businesses that are paying high taxes out there are packing up and moving their headquarters to Texas and making Texas <coughs> the business capital of the world. Yeah. Now see, Celeste's going, yeah, yeah, that's my Texas. I mean, do you understand? <laughs> we just find ourselves having an affinity for a certain part of the world. And it's okay to have that affinity. And, and it, it's important to recognize that we have it. And we recognize those behaviors. Oh, in Alabama, they put 0.0, .0 on North Dakota. Well... Oh. Shame on them. <laughs> okay, so I think that's enough cultural regions on page 219. Page 220. Traditional building materials, how people build houses. When I tell people my ancestors <clears throat> lived in sod houses, they go, what? Yeah, they cut squares out of the out of the out of the sod and let it dry and stacked it up and made walls out of it and then figured out some way to support the roof and then put a roof on the place and go how disgusting and I'm thinking well you know living in a tent sounds pretty disgusting to me Poles, bamboo, leaves, and bark. And it's just a matter of where you live. And then you use what's around there to uh, make stuff. If my student from Arkansas was here and we would have given his Arkansas handout, I would say over the weekend I was in Arkansas watching a grandson play baseball. I drove through a little town that all the buildings in town were made out of this beautiful, almost pink-like rock. And it had all been mined right there around that area. And it was just a beautiful place. I wish I would have taken a picture of it, but I didn't get around to it. But I look at some of these houses, and I'm thinking, page 221, that house is just a little too big. When I was in the south and I took a tour of a plantation, I thought, why did they build these plantation houses so big? But, watch, remember I live on a square mile where everybody has an acreage, five acres or more. I look at people building houses next to each other and I'm going, why would anyone want to live that close to your neighbor? I'm thinking everybody ought to live on five acres. It's the way God intended us to live. <laughs> Spread the city out. If everybody lived on five acres, can you imagine how big metropolitan Kansas City would be? Cool. 
And besides, I have a lot of friends who don't want to live on five acres because they say it's too much work mowing all that grass. It's not for a farmer from Oklahoma who likes to get on his little tractor and brrrr around mowing grass as a part of his recreation. <laughs> but I tell you, living in a high rise <coughs> where our daughter lived when they, <coughs> they were in Moscow, <coughs> in a big apartment, or in a little apartment, 12 stories up, that's crazy. But that's the way they live. I think maybe it's time for us to move over. Page 228 talks about the global diffusion of European culture. Okay, part of that diffusion has been because Europeans take their culture when they go someplace and sometimes impose it on people. But this is interesting to me. <clears throat> when the British Empire kind of collapsed, and all of these countries that were under British rule, when they began to rule themselves, guess what? They kept the British system of doing things because they liked the way it managed their affairs. They just didn't like the fact that the British were doing it and they wanted to do it themselves. So there's a lot of ways that uh, European culture diffuses. Probably one of the biggest things that Europeans brought to America were European germs that killed hundreds of thousands of Native Americans when they came in contact with them. Okay, it's time for us to start the next chapter as much as I'd like to keep talking about some of this stuff. Cultural imperialism on page 234. You know why you can find imperialistic behavior in every culture? Because of, what did you say that was earlier? Our sinful nature. We just have a sinful nature. But most of the stuff in this book on imperialism has to do with uh, British imperialism. But there's been other imperialistic kinds of operations <coughs> as well. Well... And page two, I already talked to you about how people in other parts of the world watch American-made movies and think all of us live like that. That's a disgusting thought. Okay, we need to spend the last, not half, but the last part of our class today starting chapter seven, the geography of languages and religions. So what religion are you? Oh, let's talk about languages first. What language are you on page 249? Is your language listed there? Yes. No. <laughs> well, on page 249, right hand column, table 7.7 1, the world's leading languages and the number of native speakers of each in millions. Is your language listed? Yes. Yeah. Where? The second one. Two, three, third. Third. And how many people speak English as a native speaker? Three hundred twenty million. Three hundred and twenty-eight million. <clears throat> and how many people live in the United States? <laughs> About three hundred and twenty-eight million. <laughs> Is what is that? <clears throat> well, you say, no, Britain's a native English-speaking country. Well, I've been to Britain. When I arrived, after traveling through Europe, I was so glad to be in an English-speaking country. I picked up the phone and dialed information and asked if they could give me the phone number for the guy that I was trying to locate in London. And this lady actually said to me in broken English, I do not understand what you're saying. I called it broken English because it wasn't the kind of English I speak. <laughs> and she said, she said it again, and I still didn't understand her. And then I said, I'm sorry. I don't speak English. I'm from the United States. 
and I don't speak British English. Do any of you speak, can any of you speak British English? <laughs> if you start speaking British English, I will tend to stand up straighter as if I should stand at attention. <laughs> because English in America is rather slouchy. <laughs> and when I told her I didn't speak English, I was from the United States, she laughed. And I just hung up the phone and had to go figure out a way to find out what this guy's phone number was because it wasn't going to work. Have you ever had a salesman call your house and ask you a question or a surveyor and you couldn't understand them? Yeah. I wish you said Because of their, their, do I say this? Indian now, Indian. see, here again, Oklahoma needs coming out. Their poor English speaking ability. Or their accent. Or their accent that gives it such a twist that I can't understand it. I guess that helps when you're like bilingual or something, or you live in another country, because then like accents come easier to you. Yes, and so then you start to pick up on it, and you can start to listen to it, but it's just like, no. I mean, even my relative from Texas, when he came to Oklahoma and told his kids to chow down, partner. By the way, did you know everybody in Texas doesn't talk like that? <laughs> what, Celeste? I'm from Texas and I don't talk like that. Okay, but you know people in Texas who do. Yeah. But you say, and here's, okay, here's what someone from Alabama told me, Celeste. That the people, because I have a, my wife's sister lives in Alabama, and we go down there and just laugh at the way they talk. And this guy, he was over at the house one time, and I said, You don't talk like the rest of these people. He said, You know, the rest of these people with this Alabama accent, they do that on purpose just to entertain visitors. Fair. He said, I was born here, and this is the way we spoke English in my house. I never learned to speak that. Alabamanese. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of people with southern accents in Texas. And in Oklahoma, I have a relative who doesn't speak English like I did in my home because she grew up in a home where they were going to speak proper English. In fact, the pastor who led me to Christ, his parents came from England. <laughs> All of his children speak English with properly as opposed to the American way. Yes? So if there's a British English, does that mean there's an Australian English too? Yeah. I think there is. I have a, okay, my daughter's husband's sister is married to an Australian and I love to listen to him talk about <laughs> stuff. He has an Australian accent. Good night, night. <laughs> See, I think probably every state has a little bit of a state accent. Yeah. Oklahoma Nese is probably more distinct than others. Okay. Carla? Oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. But it's like, it's like Spanish. Like Spanish is different in Mexico. Spanish, Cuba right? is different in Puerto Rico. Yeah. And like even different. you and KK talk different. Yeah, we, we have like different accents, Spanish, different words yeah, sometimes. Yeah. And people say like, "Don't you think? Don't you talk the same thing?" And I'm like, "Aren't yeah, you both from? Aren't you both from Puerto Rico?" No, we're not. Oh, you're not both from Puerto Rico. No. <laughs> she's she's from Panama. I'm from Puerto Rico. We speak Spanish, but we have different accents yeah. and different words. There's some things that we don't understand when mm -hmm. we talk. I talk. I speak super fast for them, for mm -hmm. everybody actually, uh, in Spanish. I speak super fast. They're like, "Wait, what did you say?" And I'm like. Oh, okay. So I have to, I have slow, to down. slow down a little bit. <laughs> so, yes. think about your language Wait. region and where you came from. And, does this surprise you? Because I have such an affinity for Oklahoma, no matter how long I live away from there, I will probably never lose the capacity to speak Oklahomanese with that Oklahoma accent. When I lived in Peoria, Illinois for five years, a guest speaker came to the church where I was attending and 
after the service I walked up and he was a professor at a university in Illinois and <clears throat> I, I walked up to him and I said you're from Oklahoma aren't you and he goes yes I am what part of Oklahoma are you from and I said Enid he said I'm from Tulsa and I said well I've made a lot of adjustments in the way I talk since I moved to Illinois <clears throat> he said I did too but how did we recognize each other? There's a little twang in our voices. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Now, see, you guys say, yeah, we know. We hear that twang in your voice. <laughs> and it, no matter how much I try to lose it, it's still got a little remnants of it will be there. And part of it's because I have an affinity for that. If I probably had a great distaste for my Oklahoma roots, I would have adopted, probably adopted Central Illinois English. No, I wouldn't. Because those people drink soda. <laughs> That's disgusting. And it's called on page 248, Dialects. So just think about if you grew up in California, you probably have a California dialect. If you grew up in Texas, Celeste, you probably have a Texas dialect. If you grew up in Kansas, you probably have a Kansas dialect. Now, sometimes when I, like for example, if you grew up in a part of Kansas where there was a German community, you might have a little bit of a German dialect with your English. How could you tell? What? Or like, how, how would you know? Okay, anyone know how to say something in German? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Whatever, whatever they say, it comes from, it's so guttural, right? I mean, isn't it's like German? yelling it. Yeah, it's just like, Wait, very angry. Yeah. yeah, it's like they sound mad about everything, Joshua. Oh, okay. I'm talking about my my friend who's been a missionary in Germany all of his life. Yeah. And he just gets right up in your face and talks so forcefully. Yeah. And it's just yeah. like it's just like, whoa, back up a little bit. <laughs> but it's just normal. And that's just normal. That's that's like the German influence. And he lived in Germany so long, he speaks English with that German Yes. I don't have a Texan accent because I grew up in Illinois and then I moved to Texas. If I had moved when I was younger and if I had been in a more culturally Texan environment, then I would have a Texan accent right now. And how long did you live in Texas? Uh, I think, how old am I? Nine years. And how long did you live in Illinois? Ten years. So she's ten years Illinois, nine years Texas. Okay, you know what the people in Texas say? I should pick up her handout because she's not from Texas. <laughs> they, should. they would say that, yeah. <laughs> See? She's, I, I know enough about Texas culture. She's not from Texas. We and like to say in Texas that either you were born there or you got there as soon as you could. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and if you're a native born Texan, yeah. <laughs> you're a full blooded Texan. Otherwise, you're a half-breed from somewhere else. <laughs> no way. So what do you call carbonated beverages? Soda. In Texas, they are soda, but we had to change when we moved down because we called it pop. <laughs> <laughs> so you changed when you got to Texas? Yeah. You called it pop in Illinois? Yeah, from northern Illinois. Oh, uh, up around Chicago? Mm -hmm. Well, this is central Illinois, Peoria. Uh, they call it sodi. Just wrong. That's just wrong. But I figured out why. The biggest employer in Peoria, Illinois is Caterpillar Tractor. They hire a lot of people from Arkansas and the South because they pay such phenomenal wages and those people are hard workers because they're building great big earth moving equipment. So when people from Arkansas who call carbonated beverages soda, moved to Illinois, they changed it a little bit 
when they live in the caterpillar culture and call it SODI. Yes? Um, just to kind of like, like further like continue that, um, what do you call, uh, or how do you pronounce, or I'll just say uh, car caramel? What? Like just that caramel. little K sugary K stuff that yeah, comes Yeah, yeah, caramel correct. or caramel. Or like is it caramel or is it caramel? Caramel. Caramel. <laughs> it's what? Caramelo. Caramelo. Caramel. What do the rest of you call it? How do you say I it? say caramel. Caramel? Yeah, caramel okay. and caramel. So those little nuts, spelled P-E-C-A-N? Pecan. But often called pecans. Wait, pecans. Pecans. Yeah. Often called pecans. What? They're often called pecans. They're often called pecans. They're often called pecans. How do you say pin? Say what? Pin, as in the ink. The writing pin. instrument? Yeah, pin. pin. So what is this I'm holding? Pen. 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 A pen? Pen. 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 Celeste, you and my wife need to leave me alone. I know what I'm talking about. And my wife goes, Tom. Pen. 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 You say it fast enough, you can't notice. Pen. See? Pen. 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 And, 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 and guess what, Shalom? Here's what they say. They say, how do you spell it? <laughs> I say, I don't care how you spell it. That's, I got that from Indiana. Okay. Uh, really? The building you live in. You go home at night and you house? live in a house. 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 It's a house. house. In Oklahoma, it's a house. house. And out in the pasture, you have cows. cows. Storm. Cows. In Minnesota, in Minnesota, you live in a house, and you have cows. And I'm thinking, who's got a chokehold on your throat, people? <laughs> and my wife says, Tom, you need to work on your pronunciations. And I said, why? She said, because you're a college professor and you have a PhD. I said, well, if I already have a PhD and I'm already a college professor, why does it matter? <laughs> <laughs> if I was trying to be one of those, then it might mean I need to camouflage the way. Oh, does this surprise you? When I went through the PhD program at the University of Missouri in Kansas City, I tried to talk as little as possible. The less they hear me say words with Oklahoma accents, the better off I'll be. But I learned how to write like the books I read, so I could write what they wanted and give them what they wanted. And so when it talks about on page 248, linguistic geography, just look at the geography of the language you carry around. Oh, I, I was talking about the world's major languages. Obviously, there's only 328 million English speakers. How many people speak Mandarin Chinese? 845 million? And guess what? My grandson is taking Chinese at school, in high school. And it's so cool. I said, Casey, say something to me in Chinese. <laughs> And my wife goes, I don't know why he didn't study Spanish. It's so much more useful than Chinese. I said, Nina, who knows, when he grows up, our relationship with China might be better than it is today, and he'll be over there working because he knows a little bit of the language, and he likes it. And while he's learning the language, he learns about Chinese culture, and he kind of likes some of that too. But I'm thinking, here in a young boy from central Missouri speak Chinese sounds pretty cool I've tried to learn a couple of foreign languages I tried Portuguese I tried Spanish Dr. Bonai, what? is it Missouri or Missouri? Missouri. Missouri. It's Missouri. Missouri. Oh boy. Missouri. Oh, no. <laughs> Missouri. <laughs> and the people in St. Louis say, you people are so disgusting. It's Missouri. It ends with an I. <laughs> no, it's misery. Okay. Misery. So, is it 
How do you say I L L I N O I S? Illinois. It's Illinois. It has an S on it. Illinois. Illinois. Okay. Okay. It's so, French. It's silent. Okay. So how do you say D E S space P L A I N S? Des Moines. That little town up close to Chicago Des Moines. called Des Plaines. Uh, Des Plaines. That's what the people up in Chicago call it. Des Plaines. They pronounce the S when it's French and it's supposed to be silent. So yes, they don't follow their own rules. All I'm good and then they give me grief about it. <laughs> What's that all about? Do you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Yeah. Or no. breakfast, lunch, dinner, supper. and supper. What is it? Breakfast, lunch, and the first meal of the day is called what? Breakfast. breakfast. The second one is called lunch. lunch. The third <laughs> one is called <laughs> <laughs> dinner or supper. It's supper. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. We'll, we'll finish up. Oh, are we going to finish up chapter 7 on Friday? I guess so. No, I'm no, no. Friday is an academic meet here oh, on campus. Oh, we don't have a class Friday. They're going to use all of our classrooms, so we can't meet here. What are we going to do? Well, I thought about taking a field trip to one of those... Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Let's take a field trip. But then I thought I don't have room in my car for all the people in this class to. I have a 12 passenger van. The 12 passenger van is dead. I was okay. okay you know how someone said on Canvas they thought it'd be fun to take a field trip to one of these oh, things. Okay. I can tell you where one is, so you can go there on your own on Friday. That's not fun, though. Yes. We're so yeah. But on my way back from Arkansas, I stopped by Mammoth Springs, and I took a video of Mammoth Springs. I'm just trying to figure out how to upload it to Canvas so you guys can have a virtual field trip. So Friday we won't be here, so I'll see you on Monday. Okay. And use Friday for a field trip to go. No, you can use Friday anyway to work on your paper. But if you want to go see one of those underground springs, go for it. I say it sometimes just because my dad says it comes out. No, I was going to say, how did you know you knew how to speak Portuguese? Um, I know of course you like to what you did in one say. I mean like sloppy is Portuguese. Sloppy. But Portuguese is basically yes. Spanish. Yeah. So some of the words are the same. Flirting time. Which is how I know. What I you uh, said. I only know that that line, just just that line, because long story short, I was uh, I worked with a whole bunch of Mexican dudes from uh, uh from my like and landscaping company. And that was their favorite line. Uh, like I, I get there every morning and and, and they're like, hello, I'm not out of casa. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and plus it helps me, you know, my younger sister was obsessed with Dora when she was here. Take care. Uh,